All right, so how many of you are enjoying yourselves today? All right, good. How many of you are bored out of your mind already? Nobody, right? That's good. But what you guys heard this morning was really, really important. So uh, uh, I'm glad we had uh, both uh, Isabel and Nicholas uh, to basically uh, tell us what's going on in Europe. And uh, what we're going to do here in this panel here is to talk about, okay, that's all cool for Europe, but uh, what the heck does it mean for us right here in the United States? So my name is Shahid. Uh, I've been an advisor to PPR uh, for a number of years, uh, obviously a very important organization. I'm glad you're all here supporting it, uh, uh, especially those that are also participating uh, online. And uh, I've been in the uh, electronic healthcare world, so on the digital data side, uh, medical devices, uh, as an engineer. So I build things for a living, and so pretty much every problem you've had with data came from guys like me, right? Because we probably did something wrong or didn't follow instructions, or maybe weren't given instructions properly. So I like to tell all engineers that they should spend a lot of time uh, talking with lawyers, for which I get throwing things at, uh, but uh, you know, there are a lot of lawyers, but not as, as many technology folks uh, as we need to really understand what's going on underneath uh, all of these requirements. And it's one thing, I mean, I love what uh, uh, Isabel said, that uh, this new GDPR is a monument. That's really what it is, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a language, it's a document that has been created, but what does it really mean? And, and that's why I'm, I'm, you know, I'm personally here because I want to learn as well, uh, but my job is to help facilitate this panel about what does that law mean uh, in Europe for the US. And what I really like about it is that it's giving us a direction. Uh, it's letting us see what the future might look like. So I, as an engineer, if I'm architecting something or something like that, uh, uh, it would have been better for me to architect starting in 2012, right? But uh, uh, better uh, late than never in this case. So uh, the way that we're gonna run this panel is uh, we've got uh, three uh, very prominent uh, legal experts as well as uh, tech experts on, on this particular field of GDPR and what it means to the United States. Uh, and uh, they're gonna come up, they're gonna do a very uh, quick introductory remarks with respect to framing uh, what we think this means in the United States. And then I'm gonna pop it open for questions uh, immediately after uh, their opening remarks. So it shouldn't take more than 10, 15 minutes, I think, uh, for all three of us, uh, all three of them. And then uh, if you guys don't have questions, we're prepared to have uh, probably about three or four hours worth of questions. So uh, uh, hopefully you guys will have uh, questions as they're coming up. Uh, so just write them down and then we'll have you uh, come up. So with that, I'm gonna let uh, Anna get started. So she's gonna do a quick intro on herself and then uh, jump into uh, her prepared remarks and then followed by Gary and then uh, uh, Stacy. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anna Spencer. I am a partner at DLA Piper, an international global law firm. Uh, I specialize in data privacy and security in the healthcare sector. I've done a lot of work uh, in my career with technology companies, cloud computing companies, pharmaceutical manufacturers, healthcare providers, really any entity that wants to process health information. So I work on compliance issues and data breach. Uh, also, I'm a registered lobbyist. I'm working on federal legislation to change the healthcare laws in the United States. So uh, today, I'm going to uh, speak with you about GDPR. Uh, I only have about five minutes, so I'm gonna try to make it really quick. Uh, but uh, just wanted to first sort of start out with, you know, for those that are, are still becoming familiar with the, the regulation. Uh, it went into, or it, it has gone into effect. It will, um, enforce, uh, enforcement will start or compliance is required as of May 25th. So we don't have a lot of time, obviously. Um, there's a great website, it's eugdpr.org that has a, a countdown. So by the minute, it's like a doomsday calendar, which I think is great. So um, I, I, it, although it causes panic, I will say when you look at that, you think, oh my God, we've got so much to do. Uh, but you know, that is not a lot of time. Hopefully uh, companies have already started their compliance efforts. If not, you really need to put it into overdrive at this point. So the GDPR, as many of you know, uh, really means detailed risk-based rules for processing personal data. It's not just for internet companies, okay? That is a common uh, misconception, I think. Uh, it, it is classic EU regulation, and some of you will appreciate that comment and some of you won't. That is, uh, that is uh, dripping with uh, my own personal view of this, but, uh, or bias, but it is, what I mean by that in, in, in that it's classic EU regulation is that it's regulation on steroids. 
it, it, it regulates the waterfront front. It really doesn't allow uh, a lot of flexibility. I don't think that anyone would accuse the regulators here of creating a law that is flexible and scalable. Um, there is, of course, a greater regulatory risk exposure here. Uh, the fines are breathtaking. So as, as, again, many of you have probably heard, it's up to 200, uh, or sorry, uh, 200 million euros or 4% uh, of worldwide turnover, whichever is greater. And that would, of course, rival, that's, that's amazing, that would rival any FCPA case, any False Claims Act case, uh, if it's, of course, we don't know yet, it could be a paper tiger. Uh, we don't have enforcement history yet, but if, if as intended, uh, so it was um, the competition law enforcement and regulations that really inspired uh, the, the penalty provisions of GDPR. So if it's, if it's enforced the same way, we're looking at hundreds of millions of, of penalties potentially. So that should get the attention of uh, the leadership of, of any company that processes personal information of EU residents. Um, the GDPR it invites plenty of forthcoming legislation as I'll talk about uh, in a moment. Uh, there's a lot of uh, places, actually 30 uh, instances in the regulation where it says that member states are allowed to l legislate in addition to, to the general framework. So if you think about that, that, that really means that we do not have, we will not have just one nice harmonized set of laws, which is what we were supposed to have, or at least that was initially one of the, the, the good, the, the advantages that was being discussed. We're going to have what we have today which is you know, a really fractured set of rules at both the um, uh, EU level and the member state level. I've already mentioned the penalties very, very, can be very high. Um, so I, I also wanted, because this is um, a, a, a health care conference, I wanted to focus on some of the, the issues for life science companies. So um, just two quick issues, I've already uh, addressed one of them. There's the numerous derogations or exemptions that really detract from legal harmonization here. Uh, that's going to be a problem. That means that companies that, that operate on a global basis uh, in many jurisdictions within the EU, they're going to have to pay attention still uh, to the member state uh, derogations. And then secondary research. Uh, that's another big issue for life science companies like pharmaceutical manufacturers that sponsor uh, clinical trials. Uh, this is one area where I think, depending on what the member states do, the regulation is actually helpful to them. So it's not uncommon uh, in uh, research for, for the need to emerge for additional research or related research. So if you're researching the effect of um, a chemotherapy agent or a, an anti-cancer drug, uh, in one disease state, you want to, it's very clear that it may have ut uh, efficacy in another uh, type of cancer. So the, the, the issue often becomes, right now, we're pouring over informed consents to see if they were written broadly enough to cover that additional research. But under the GDPR, uh, there are, there is a, a discussion, and it's in recital 50 in particular, uh, that I think is, is potentially very helpful and that would allow, in, in a sort of a broad way, secondary research. However, uh, the member states are allowed, as I think it was discussed already today, to uh, create additional requirements in, with respect to consent for research purposes. And so that is an area that's sort of um, unknown. We'll have, to, we'll have to watch. And then I think my time's uh, wrapping up already, um, but I did just want to mention that the rest of the slides that I have were an attempt to give you some ideas to organize the chaos. It's obviously a lot if you, as you become more and more familiar with the regulation, it's very clear that the, uh, the job of implementing this very significant law can be overwhelming. And so just giving you some tools to think about um, Again, breaking, breaking up, how do, you, how do you go about this into scoping it, um, 
assessing uh, your, your current compliance versus where you need to be, so identifying the gaps. And part of that would be also engaging in a uh, mapping, data mapping or inventory, figuring out where your data is and where it goes. Uh, and then building your program, your policies and, and procedures, uh, appointing a privacy officer, and then managing the, the whole thing. So on, a, on an ongoing basis. It's not enough that you develop these policies and procedures, but you then have to audit for compliance and sort of keep track of uh, new developments and then integrate that into your program. It has to be a living program. It can't just, you're not one and done here ever. Um, and then I have many slides on what I mean by data mapping, and there's actually a lot of different approaches to data mapping. Um, they, ha they all have positives and, and negatives associated with them, pros and cons, and I've, I've described them on each of these slides. This is, this is really the nitty gritty of compliance, so please take a look at those. These are the, these are the data maps that we, my team engages in, um, and, and, and then finally my last slide is some uh, big ticket items that you need to be thinking about in terms of GDPR compliance, and I hope that these are, are helpful to you. Yeah, that's great. So tell us a little bit about the applicability. So multinationals, that one's easy, right? You, you have some jurisdiction. The company has a, a, a facility or something like that in Europe. W to walk us back from that, from that obvious one to the others, like small, medium businesses, we're, who should care about this at all yeah. uh, and who should not? That's a, great, that's a great question. So I'm sure maybe the other panelists will have a thought on this. But uh, the, the reach is incredibly broad. So it's not just applicable to multinationals. It applies to, for example, a U.S. company that has only U.S. operations but collects data on EU individuals in order to market or, or sell products to those individuals. So those companies uh, can be caught off guard thinking, well, I don't operate in the EU per se. I don't have a building there. I don't have any formal offices, it doesn't matter. Um, so it has yeah. a really broad reach. Yeah. And, and for us in healthcare, here's a very good example, which I've seen get caught because it, uh, when I build systems, we have to know if a person from Europe is flying in and gets a heart transplant at uh, DeBakey Heart Center in Houston, for example, and then flies back, that data that's being, that you kept locally now potentially is connected to that Europe, European citizen who came down, got the service. You don't have, I mean, DeBakey is sitting literally in Houston. It's not anywhere else, but they're going to now have to at least think about this, if not know precisely what to do. So it can get very, very tricky, even though most of us don't necessarily need to care. I think we all have to think about it to figure out how much do I, how much do I need to care and more importantly then, what, what would the enforcement look like in that case? Uh, so there's, there's no European enforcement agency here. What, what, what would that look like? Well, so I mean, I, I, so uh, to my earlier point, this could be a paper tiger. We, we don't know, but uh, you know, it, certainly the, the potential for high penalties is there. And in terms of enforcement, I mean, you're looking at um, you know, reliance on treaties and agreements, multilateral agreements between countries in order to enforce, but they, they, can, they can reach a U.S. company. Got it. Yeah, sure. Great. All right. Excellent. So that was a good intro. And uh, uh, these slides will be made, of course, available to you guys uh, afterwards as well, so you can uh, have that. And then uh, Gary's going to run through a little bit, just go, again, another level of detail, but then be ready for your questions for any one of us uh, up here as well. Go ahead, Gary. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to first Deborah, thank Deborah and the rest of her team for the opportunity to be here. The quality of the speakers and the content so far has been amazing, so I'll do everything I can to kind of keep up that bar. Um, I did want to mention, we're not supposed to be self-promotional, but I don't think TED Talks are viewed as uh, self-promotional. Um, the last session was really, really good, and I would encourage you to go to ananos.com slash TED Talk. My business partner, Ted Meyerson, gave a talk on exactly that, what technology might mean in medical research and be able to free up some of the conflicts of consent. So I just wanted to hit upon that. Um, companies typically, in my background, by the way, my name is Gary Lefevre and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ananos, and we are a privacy-enhancing technology developer. Uh, we spent the last five years developing technology that bridges the requirements of law and technology, not exclusively for GDPR, but it absolutely has applicability there. Companies typically come to Ananos after they've worked with Anna or someone like her. They've done the assessment of the information that they have, they've done a data protection impact assessment, and ultimately they come to a question. How do I do business now? As we've discussed, consent has incredible limitations. 
And the GDPR actually has built within it, I believe, we believe, a very optimistic approach called data protection by default. And that's what I'm going to touch upon a couple other things very quickly, but obviously we want to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, I was on a panel in January with Gwendal Legrand. Gwendal is the chief technologist and head of in innovation at the French Data Protection Authority, the CNIL. And he had a question asked of him, and that was, how much of a grace period do we have to comply with the GDPR? And his answer was twofold. One, your grace period is when the clock hits May 25th, 2018. You have an immediate obligation to comply. However, we gave you two years after it was adopted before we start to enforce. And so a follow-up question was, why two years? And his answer was, because you're going to need that long to develop technology to do what is required under the GDPR if it has never been required before. And that's really the rub. So I'm going to touch upon three things and corollaries between HIPAA and the GDPR. Consent, re-identification risk, and minimal necessary. We had a fantastic presentation, I have to get those slides, on the shortcomings of consent. And what the GDPR does is it severely restricts explicitly what you can even claim consent covers. The data subject has to give specific and unambiguous approval to what you're about to do. And if you can't describe with specificity and unambiguity what you're about to do, the consent doesn't work. It's not a legal basis, and therefore you do not have the right to do it. And I want to just highlight the magnitude of the misunderstanding. If you Google today, this is an article today, why data is the new oil, even at Shell. There's an article published today in which the speaker, not understanding what the GDPR requires, says that we will make it clear, she's referring to the GDPR, in our wording, that if you give us permission to speak to you, you'll receive this offer or that promotion. And what she's saying is that's how they're going to get rights to data for data analytics and artificial intelligence. And it doesn't work that way. And so it's not a valid legal basis for anything that has iterative questioning involved. How do you describe in advance with specificity and unambiguity, and ambigu it's a tough word, unam uh, not ambiguous, um, <laughs> what the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth question are, which are going to be triggered by your answers to the first or second. So consent absolutely doesn't work. But there is a means to do it, and I'll touch upon that really quickly and, and obviously during the questions. There's a huge impact here that a lot of people overlook. How many historical databases on May 25th, 2018 are going to go dark and no longer be legal to use? If your means of acquiring that data does not comply with the GDPR, Gwenda Legrand's comment from the CNIL that there's no grandfather provision means your databases go dark if you don't re-treat those. And it's probably not re-consent because if you re-consent, you'll only get consent to the questions you can ask. So this is a big deal. Secondly, re-identification risk. There's a new word or a new definition of a word that's hard to say. It's worse than unambiguity, whatever. It's pseudonymity. Pseudonymity is defined in the GDPR in a way that Latanya Sweeney should love. Because the problem that we have in the US, one of several, <clears throat> is that re-identification risk is an illusion. It even says in the HHS regs that it's okay if a covered entity knows that the information can actually be re-identified as long as they've adopted either the safe harbor or the expert determination. So we basically always all acknowledge that it's relatively easy to re-identify. <clears throat> the definition of pseudonymity under the GDPR is magical. It says you have to separate the information value of data from the means of re-identifying, which means you cannot use consistent tokens, consistent pseudonyms. That is exactly what is done in the US. So again, a technical requirement. Lastly, minimal necessary. We give that lip service in the US, but in the GDPR, it actually is required. And so it requires that you, first off, as opposed to what we do here, you protect data by default. Secondly, you reveal or disclose only those elements necessary for given authorized use. And upon conclusion of that use, you reprotect the data. So with those three, this may be very difficult to see, uh, but the reason this is of value, and anyone who would like a copy of this, if you want to give me your card, I'll be back later this afternoon here tomorrow, or if you're online, if you want to send an email to bigprivacy at anonymous.com, the reason this is very valuable 
is it takes a statute that in six point font is that long and it shows you a graphical interrelationship between these issues. So you have the legal bases on the left. There's six of them. You have to find one of them that works. Consent won't for artificial intelligence, machine learning, or even historical databases or analytics. But legitimate interest does. And it walks you through the interrelationship and what the underpinnings of these requirements are as shown by the roots. So it tries, and it's always hard, but some of us are visual learners, to reflect at a high level the interrelationships and necessity for a new legal basis called legitimate interest to enable you to do this work. And then the last one out to the right on research, it's true. The GDPR actually expands your ability to do research, but you have to comply with Article 9 requirements for safeguards. And so it walks through that as well. So if anyone's interested, happy to give you a copy of this that's actually annotated with all the references to the articles and the recitals and that, are, that are associated. And lastly, so this is the big deal. I slided off, started off with a slide, win, win, win. For who? Data regulators. What if you actually can comply? What if you can truly have a humanistic approach to use of data? Two, data controllers. What if you actually can allow people to use data without risk? And lastly, but most importantly, what if you can respect the fundamental rights of data subjects? The GDPR provides this. It's called data protection by default. It requires pseudonymity as defined under the GDPR. Here's the thing. Existing technologies don't do this. So what's happening right now is you have a bunch of vendors putting GDPR on their front page, and they do a great job of helping with security. But the GDPR goes further than security. Privacy is different than security. And what it really comes down to is you have to be protecting your data while it's in use, not just at rest or in transit. So, Last of my slides, happy to provide that visual to anyone who's interested, and look forward to your questions. Great. Uh, Gary, that was excellent. Uh, so uh, bridge the gap now between Anna's uh, uh, legal side and you're on the technology side. She talked a lot about uh, data mapping and what we really refer to as data inventory. So if you don't even know where your data is, the rest of this is an academic discussion. Correct. Right? So in that model, what are you guys seeing at Anonymous to see um, so lawyers seem to be able to read documents and understand them and explain them to you. Engineers who know where data is could possibly tell you uh, that data is uh, either encrypted, non-encrypted, anonymized, not anonymized. W what about that gap of all that stuff that you don't know, right? There's at any given typical hospital, medical uh, practice, et cetera, there's a ton of data sitting that they don't know. It's sitting in an access database, it's sitting in an Excel file, might, might be in some databases. W what, how, how are you seeing people successfully do that data inventory, which they need to even do for HIPAA, are they doing that well and they can extend that? Or are they not doing that well at all and it makes the data mapping and the data inventory uh, near impossible to start, which means you can't, you can't actually comply with almost anything that you put up on the previous slide. So the best thing about gaps is if you can build a bridge against them or across them, it's an opportunity. I actually have not just a technical background, I used to practice law as a partner at Hogan Levels. And so if you approach the issue from both a technical and a legal perspective, you actually can cross the gap. So with issues like you're talking about, even the GDPR does not require absolutism. You have to show that you have reasonable technical and organizational measures in place and that you've taken reasonable steps to find, disclose, and to inventory. And as long as you can document the reasonableness of your activities, the fact that some things may have been left, which they will be, you, you should not be penalized for that. So again, you have to take reasonable steps, but the GDPR truly is a game changer. And so if you're just doing what you did before and being reasonable at that, I think that's unreasonable. You have to adopt a new mindset of what the GDPR sets forth, but if you do that, you're not gonna be held to perfection. Great, and then uh, this comment then on the other question of uh, assuming you don't have facilities in Europe where you absolutely have to care, should anyone in the U.S. actually care about this? So I was going to be polite and not disagree with you, but you invited <laughs> this. Um, I believe you said most of us shouldn't have to care. I think it's the opposite. Every single one of us should care because the interpretations that I've read are actually if a non-EU citizen is in the EU and processing occurs, it's applicable as well. So in essence, if you have a data store with one or more, but as little as one record, that relates to either someone who is an EU resident or someone was in, e was in the EU when it was captured, it applies. We are working with companies now who have expats in the EU and they realize that they have to fully comply with this law. So 
I think there's maybe two people in this room that it doesn't apply to. So I would have to take the opposite position. Every single one of us should be concerned and more than concerned should invest themselves into it because I do believe that your GDPR and its concept of data protection by default could address a lot of the shortcomings that this organization is about, which is giving people more control and protection and, and rights in their data. Great. So like a regular engineer, I was just hoping that uh, ignorance would be okay, no? <laughs> you have to put more words around it in your eye. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, Stacy, go ahead. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, and a very special thank you to Deborah and to Amber for their outstanding organization and the invitation. Um, because we've had so much background regarding the GDPR this morning, I was just asked to provide three minutes regarding my background in this area. Although I currently serve on faculty at the UNLV Boyd School of Law, I spent the first decade of my career as a civil, regulatory, operational, and transactional healthcare attorney, both in the Health Industries Group in the Houston office of the international law firm Vincent & Elkins, as well as in my own private law firm, representing individual and institutional healthcare providers and private payors in a wide variety of HIPAA matters. Um, I have spent more time advising my covered entity clients regarding the HIPAA privacy rule than I have any other area of health law since January uh, 2001, uh, which is just a few days after HHS published the original, final HIPAA privacy rule back on December 28, 2000. Um, I'm now finishing the second decade of my career, which has been focused on teaching and publishing in a range of health law areas, including HIPAA privacy. Um, in the past, I have taught a three-credit HIPAA privacy course at UNLV and at other schools, and to help my students wrap their heads around the HIPAA privacy rule, I divide that class up into four different areas, including the use and disclosure requirements, the individual rights provisions, the breach notification requirements, and the administrative requirements. And just so you can see how the EU GDPR is finally filtering down to U.S. law schools, deans are now asking us to incorporate the EU GDPR. So in the past, where we would teach a class called HIPAA privacy, now we're being asked to teach broader classes regarding patient privacy and health information confidentiality, including um, not only the HIPAA privacy rule, but also the EU GDPR. I also write a lot about HIPAA, uh, including but certainly not limited to instructing physicians on how to comply with the privacy rule, some of the problems and perspectives I have with the privacy rule, how development officers at nonprofit hospitals should comply with the privacy rules fundraising provisions. But even if you claim only to be, as I do, a U.S., meaning a U.S. federal and state health information confidentiality expert, you cannot avoid the EU GDPR. Um, just as an example, I actually met Anna, I think, um, this past fall at Seton Hall because I was asked to do a comparison between the HIPAA privacy rule and the EU GDPR. And I initially turned down that speaking invitation because I said I'm only a HIPAA expert. I do not do the EU GDPR. And they uh, dragged me kicking and screaming into that. So regardless of whether you're teaching um, in HIPAA privacy or in any area of federal or state in the United States health information confidentiality or you're writing in that area, you cannot avoid the EU GDPR. Finally, although I've been teaching for the past decade, I still do maintain a really active law practice in Texas where I'm licensed. And um, as you know, Houston is a very international city, and a lot of my clients will say to me, um, especially my hospitals in the Texas Medical Center, that treat a lot of patients that are not U.S. patients, and they will say to me, I only need to know the HIPAA privacy rule and, of course, Texas Health Information Confidentiality Law. Um, and I'm having to, unfortunately, as a HIPAA person, um, educate them and tell them that is not true as well for the reasons that we've already heard. But I'm also taking on an increasing number of patient advocacy and pro bono matters on behalf of patients and families, including U.S. patients and families. And I recently just got my first international patient and family a few weeks ago. Um, and they are asking me to file complaints with only the Federal Office for Civil Rights here in the United States. Um, and I'm also being pulled into litigation, which seems at first only to be U.S. based, um, including litigation involving um, whether the HIPAA privacy rule uh, can stand as the evidence of the standard of care relating to privacy, and now we're seeing whether the EU GDPR or other kind of international regulations should also serve as a regulation when we're dealing with hospitals that have international uh, locations or hospitals that treat international patients. And third, I do a lot of expert witnessing in litigation involving HIPAA. So in my last two seconds, I'll just say that the perspective I bring to you uh, today is that of a practitioner, an academic, and a consultant who had two feet um, in U.S. and I would say state health information confidentiality law, but who has been pulled kicking and screaming into the EU GDPR. 
That, that's great, Stacey. So uh, come on up with, with your uh, questions. Uh, so uh, basically, you've got uh, uh, three lawyers and one engineer and another uh, bunch of uh, technology knowledge here. So uh, uh, we can all answer questions with respect to implementation uh, or more specifically about uh, the uh, broad regulations themselves. So anywhere you guys want to start, uh, Adrian, as usual. <laughs> Always has a question. Always. Uh, so uh, from your perspective, you're all out there uh, in practice, in the trenches. Give us the good news. Um, uh, seriously, I, uh, and I don't mean uh, fun to be funny. Uh, what can you imagine is going to be enabled by either GDPR or by any shift that it might drive in terms of HIPAA going forward? Yeah, I, I wrote a, a, a blog post um, just a couple of days ago. Uh, it's open season on privacy in Washington, uh, health privacy in Washington, D.C. And that's because there are many privacy-related initiatives uh, that are going on, in, uh, you know, in very recently. Uh, not just in healthcare, in internet, uh, ISPs, and things like that. So, uh, from your perspective, uh, what kind of goodness, what kind uh, can we expect on either side of the Atlantic? I'm happy to go. Um, we're actually very bullish on this. <clears throat> Again, if you look at what the requirements are for complying with the GDPR, it's all tied to sharing only that level of information value necessary for a given intended use. And unfortunately, the way things happen, the internet spoiled us all. You can find out everything about just about anybody, when in fact, you don't need that level of granularity. And so if data protection by default becomes an established approach to processing, and you can show technologically that identifying information is not imparted when information value necessary for research occurs, I think you could open up vast new stores of research and discoveries because the people whose information is involved will know that technologically it's not just a contract, right? There's a great saying that consent is just one way to put all the risk on the individual, right? You know, 40, 50 page click through I agrees. No one reads these things. The 190 page document that the parents had to sign while the kid needed something, you're putting everything on the shoulders of the individual. If you can technologically have gradations of information value that are offset by identifi identifiability, and these, these are not, you know, these concepts of data science have been around, they just haven't been done well. And so the GDPR actually makes them the law. If that takes root, I think great things could be enabled. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with everything Gary said. Um, I also uh, think that one of the good things to come out of GDPR is that it just raises the consciousness of companies about the importance of protecting the, their digital assets, their, their information, in a way that they didn't before, I think because that sword of these breathtaking penalties, every executive can quickly grasp that, very concerned about it. Um, and so that has meant, I think, that, that uh, companies are much more focused on privacy, whereas in the past they may not have given it as much attention as it deserves. I think the raising consciousness point is a good one. Um, many times I'm asked by, um, say, a hospital in Houston about a particular provision in the GDPR, and I will remind them that what they're asking me about usually is also regulated by federal U.S. law or Texas law in that case, and so it's always an opportunity for me to re remind them regarding their uh, domestic obligations as well. So I think raising consciousness for um, clients like mine is very, very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I see the biggest uh, benefit probably is around uh, creating a sustainable demand uh, for businesses to, quote, do the right thing. Because one problem right now is that when you look at HIPAA and all the other regulations around it, uh, PII versus PHI, per, uh, personally identifiable information versus protected health information, I, as an engineer, when I'm architecting something, when, right now, my, it's very simple. You give me data, I got this big box, and I just stuff it in there. And, and whenever I want it, I go pick it out and filter it, et cetera. But GDPR says... If I'm architecting a system today, I need to create multiple buckets in multiple areas. I need to track provenance. I need to have audit histories at the field and element level, not at the big box level like I often do today. So it helps me as a designer know where I should go. And then it will create a demand for companies like, uh, like Gary's here 
to do the right thing. Because we really don't, we, we all want to do the right thing, but there has to be a demand in the business uh, side to be able to pay for it, sustain it, and, and keep it moving. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of uh, goodness here with a lot of work uh, down the pike. So we took one question here. We'll take one here and then flip back and forth. I'm Joy Pritz. Um, our first speaker today indicated that there is a little bit of a nuance as to when U.S. companies would actually be governed by uh, the GDPR, which included, I, from my notes, targeting EU citizens. And she gave one example, which was if you accept you know, euros, then that would probably bring you within that category of targeting EU citizens. Can you talk a little bit about that nuance to this? And uh, it, to me, it seems like it might kind of narrow a little bit uh, the applicability to companies in the U.S., and there might be actually actions that U.S. companies could take to at least try to escape the long arm of the EU reg. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joy. Uh, so I think her use of the term nuanced was nuanced. <laughs> um, the reality is the law is very clear. If, if you are processing data, it does not require payment. It does not require a, a, a physical facility. It does not require any revenue at all. Um, that's why I wasn't being trite when I said there's maybe two people in this room who are not governed by this law. If you are processing or observing, if, if you are watching the activities of somebody and they're either in the EU or an EU citizen, it's going to be impacted. So I, I, I think the same energy that may go into trying to avoid the law would be better invested in trying to understand how it actually could be an advantage. And I truly believe it can be. Right. You guys have any comments? Go ahead. I live in Las Vegas right now, and so far our economy has really been focused on gaming and entertainment and hospitality, but my city really would like to improve our economy through medical tourism. So I'll just say that in my city, um, a lot of our healthcare providers, they're trying so hard to target um, you know, international uh, patients and to bring them to Las Vegas and so this issue is just coming up more and more in what I consider to be a very pretty small uh, local city. Mm -hmm. And remember, there's only two kinds of data, right? Data in transit and data at rest. If you're a processor, you're doing both, uh, one or both. And if you're sometimes just moving data, that's the, called uh, uh, data in motion. Um, but uh, GDPR covers both sides. So uh, I think uh, Gary's right. There's far, yeah. pro quite a uh, limited number of people who are not up. Just to reinforce what Gary was saying, I mean, the, the, the actual text says offering of goods or ser services irrespective of whether payment of the data subject is required uh, to data subjects of the, of, the, of the union. So I do think that I'm encouraged by the comment that the speaker made, but there's nothing in the text that supports that. And, and just another point that we haven't touched upon. Um, while under HIPAA, both covered entities and business associates, associates have direct obligations under the statute, the GDPR goes further. They're jointly and severally liable for each other's shortcomings. So if you're a data controller and your data processor doesn't satisfy the requirements, you're both at risk and you can be held accountable for the full amount and then have to go against your data processor and vice versa. So we're talking billions of dollars in potential liability here, and I think very difficult means to avoid it, which is why, and again, I wasn't trying to be trite, I think the energy invested in trying to figure out if you can avoid it is probably better spent and how you can turn it into an asset. Yeah, and one, one thing to recognize is that in healthcare, we've lived this for a couple, for quite a while, a couple of decades almost, where you have a covered entity and then a business associate. Uh, those are well-defined terms and fairly well understood. Imagine everybody else. They've never done this. They've not had the difference between a controller uh, of the data and the processor of the data. And now they have to do the same thing. So what the big benefit here, going back to Adrian's question, is everybody else now has to think this way. So we're going to be able to, in healthcare, we now can look outside and say, okay, a covered entity is a controller. A business associate is a processor. And then a subject, of course, is the patient and et cetera. So that's really nice now is we're not, we're not alone anymore. Everybody has to live our life. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Tom Trezise, my question is, in my work I wear different hats and on different days, you know, I show up with different conversations. So today I'm here for health care. Uh, as I put another hat on, though, uh, I'm facing the same issues that we are in healthcare. And one of my frustrations is, is usually 
at least 100 people working on the same thing and they don't know they're all working on the same thing. So I always look for ways for people to collaborate and partner. Is there any process going on for us who have just had this conversation and go, oh my God, I got work to do. Is there any natural partnerships that you can, uh, we could use or partner up with instead of going it alone? It would make sense. Uh, I mean, online gaming, tourism, healthcare, I mean, all of those interact and intersect. Do you see any natural collaborations that ought to take place uh, to do this work? There's a group, if you're not familiar with it, actually probably many of you are members, the uh, International Association of Privacy Professionals. The IAPP does great work and it goes cross vertical. And so you get a lot of benefit of that. Um, if you're interested, the, 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 the conference that I mentioned, we had I think over 600 people who actually showed it was a webinar conference and over 5,000 people have downloaded the materials. That's actually at anonos.com slash GDPR. That's all IAPP. So the IAPP, and I guess it's IAPP.org, is a fantastic organization that I think would be your biggest bang for the buck. And are there actual working groups in there that yes. says, yes. like the tourism industry and the healthcare industry ought to have a, a dual working group on this? To, I'm not sure that there is now, but if you raised it, you would be the chairman of it. <laughs> uh, forget I asked. <laughs> <laughs> now, anybody else want to add anything? Uh, Okay. I'll just say my yeah. university, it's funny that you mentioned those three areas. Um, my university mm -hmm. is very good in hotel, we're very good in gaming, and now we think we're good in law and we're hoping to get good in health law. And note that we're capitalizing on those three areas and we all work together. So I work with our gaming law folks and our hospitality law folks, even though I have no background in gaming law or hospitality law, um, because we're all becoming pulled in together. Yeah, and one thing I would do is for anybody outside of healthcare, this is one of the weirdest things to say is come to healthcare to learn. Uh, in our industry, and because we've been having to live this, uh, so there, there's a lot of uh, work product uh, that, that is available to describe BAs, business associates, and uh, agreements in this area. So th there's actually quite a bit of body that we can use to help raise the, and lift everybody else. And the other thing is to keep it in an open and uh, um, about open data and open uh, APIs, asking your vendors. The vendors are going to have to solve this. There's no scenario where this is going to be handled legally, right? It's going to have to be vendors. It's Microsoft, it's Oracle, it's the folks who make the databases. Uh, there are, there's a technology called the virtual private database that allows you to keep things separated in common stores, and that has to be put on steroids over the next few years as well. So uh, next here. Uh, Lucia Savage. Um, so first of all, thank you for validating my read on GDPR. I've been a health a lawyer for a long time. I'm like, oh, we already have all this in healthcare except the engineering piece in which we're retarded. Right. But um, <laughs> my question is actually about the sort of right of a person to get their own data. So we've had this in the American system on healthcare for a very long time. Spent a lot of effort in the last two years trying to put that on steroids and make it digital. I recently I had a chance to ask for my data a couple times. I won't tell you how complicated, uh, you know, nerve wracking and tear inducing it was. And I do this for a living. But for, how is that going to work for um, individuals when GDR, GDPR presents? Is it going to be easier in America in healthcare? Is that technology that's going to be required engineering from Europe going to sort of flow downstream here and we'll get paper out of the system so that things become more automatic? Or will it be more like, uh, you know, everyone who holds the data think, it, think it's really theirs and they put artificial barriers in, in, the, in the process of a person accessing their own data? Anybody want to go first? So one of the biggest things about the GDPR is it's a huge hand that's going to slap you if you don't do it right. Um, so I, I, I agree. Actually, people who don't have a background in, in health care should look at HIPAA and the privacy rule and the security rule. There's, there's a ton of information there that whether or not the GDPR used or not, I see a lot of it. Um, but one of the big differences here is, I mean, let's look minimal necessary. We're still waiting for guidance on that, right? There's a lot of things, that, I mean, that what, what Deborah talked about before, something that was passed years ago, there hasn't been anything. The problem here is the penalties are assessed on private organizations at a magnitude that have never been seen. And so the, the good thing and bad thing about EU law is it, it's, it's more aspirational and less specific. So we are, tend to be very precise in our lawmaking in the U.S. And it, it, the, the good news is there's clarity and you know what, what you are or are not supposed to do. The bad news is it gets dated real quickly. Um, the GDPR is another thing which is unique. It actually has a, a statutory obligation to maintain the state of the art in technology. 
So you have to stay to what's the, the greatest and the best. There's no specifics as to how you support data portability, the right of uh, a data subject to get their data, but the penalty is large enough that I think it's going to cause commercial ventures to figure that out real quick. Just to add to that, I mean, I think that um, the w one thing that's positive in the U.S. is that there has been recent enforcement against companies for not, you know, honoring the right of access, at least under HIPAA. We haven't had that enforcement yet under the GDPR. So I do think that there is some in more incentive now than ever in the healthcare sector to give people the, the, their own data. However, uh, one of the real obstacles, which you alluded to, Lucia, is that is the fact that you know the data is in silos. So you have to go. There's no one repository, and you have to go to a bunch of different places to try even to make anything close to a comprehensive record of your own health information. And I don't think that there's anything under GDPR that would change that. Yeah, it wouldn't. I mean, just to give a simple answer, it's not. And nothing is going to get easier on that particular question. In fact, uh, the only thing that's going to drive that is we need to have demand, right? If once a week you get a request from one patient, it's not that important. You're going to find any way to do it. You get 50 requests a week from patients asking you for data. That changes. You get 500 or 5,000. So it's a. If we can get patients to say, start asking for more then it drives the technology. Other than that, I'm not sure it's going to actually drive that right. much. Or, uh, or another, another idea, which is one that I'm working on, is, is allowing the, fo the, the companies in the U.S. who have aggregated data, like clearinghouses. So the clearinghouses sit between the providers and the plans, and if we expand the right of access just a little bit under federal law, individuals have a right to receive that information. It's already aggregated. It's not an EHR, but it's claims data, and it's rich in information. So uh, there are some there are some policy uh, uh, efforts that are that are moving that could make some positive change changes for people. Right. And we only have 90 seconds left for before our panel ends, so we can take one. Which side did we go last time? It was over there, me. Okay, over here. Okay, so you get the last time. Uh, since we have Thanks. a bunch of lawyers here, I'm going to ask you a rather legalistic question. I mean, there's been a focus on HIPAA, and I've always been saying for 21 years, if you only focus on HIPAA and healthcare, you're being stupid. Yeah. Uh, there's no other way around it. So you have other laws that I'm wondering whether it provides some basis to take some comfort in dealing with GDPR. You have the Fair Credit Reporting Act. You have the Computer Security and Fraud Act. You have the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, all which, in fact, that one might be the most relevant, is that it asks for explicit consent. Uh, and we see law, uh, court case after court case about people getting calls on their cell phones and yada, 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 whether HIPAA is on that. So I'm wondering, and also above and beyond that, you have the deteriorating barrier between a consumer and a patient. Go to the Consumer Electronics Show any year and you'll see that the difference is almost non-existent and people are getting confused as to whether they are patients or consumers, whether they're using FDA regulated products or not FDA regulated products, whether they're going to be uh, hammered by the FTC or the Consumer Product Commission, and I can go on and on and make everybody crazy. So the question then becomes, with all that said, and healthcare having had experience with all of these laws, whether the GDPR is just going to be something that makes compliance folks go, okay, let's take all these together now and have a coherent one kind of compliance plan rather than a HIPAA compliance plan, a one for our telephone, our marketing plan for TCPA, and then something right. for consumer fraud and abuse. Yeah, no, that makes no sense. So we only have about 30 seconds, so you guys want to take it home? I'll take a really quick Yes or no? Uh, <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> Because in the United States, we're all about pragmatism. I mean, you've got different, we, and, and the way we've approached privacy is sectoral. I don't think that that's going to change in our lifetime, maybe in, in the next generation, but um, we have different requirements and we treat d d data differently based on financial, credit reporting, uh, health, and uh, internet. And that's not, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. I, I share some of your optimism, and here's why. When we talk to companies, nothing happens until they get the data innovation team in the room, the compliance team in the room, the, the business people who are trying to generate revenues, and when those three people talk, and you know what's scary? Sometimes when we're in the room, it's the first time these people have met each other. So breaking down the silos is the only way you can comply with the GDPR. So maybe in time, your aspiration becomes reality.
Do you have anything to add? And I'll just say that that sectoral approach applies um, to lawyers and to academics as well. You have experts in HIPAA, but not in this and not in that. And you end up with people who can answer one question under one in one industry under one regulation, but they can't put it all together. Right. And uh, just on the engineering side, we have to do it. We, that's the only way we do it. We, don't, we do not look at these as separate rules. We combine them, abstract them, implement them at technology, and then say, okay, lawyers, what do you guys want to do with it? So I, I'm more optimistic on the engineering side that we can do that, and maybe it grows from that point on, uh, but uh, your point is well valid. Let's give a big round of applause to Anna, Gary, uh, Stacy. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed this. Of course, uh, I think they'll be around during lunch. Uh, so I know there was a bunch of more questions, which was great. Uh, uh, so I appreciate everybody uh, asking questions. Thank you.